Right, thanks everybody. I'm Liz Ferguson. I'm one of the uh, board of directors of Dryad and my day job is at Wiley and I'm here to introduce our Community Perspectives Forum. And this is a slot in which we're going to hear from three speakers who've all got experience of data archiving alongside publication activities and they're going to share those experiences with us. They'll each talk for about 20 minutes each and we have five minutes at the end of each presenter um, for everyone to ask questions or to share back your own experiences of these kinds of activities. Um, we'll try to keep everything on track so we can get through our agenda in good time. So I'll introduce the three speakers now to prevent hopping up and down later. First, we're going to hear from Tim Vines, who is the Managing Editor of Molecular Ecology and the Director of Axios Review. After Tim, we'll hear from Brooks Hansen, who is Director of Publications at our host here at the American Geophysical Union. And after Brooks, we'll hear from Evka Smith, a fellow member of the Board of Directors and Director of Technology and Standards at the STM Association. So with no further ado, I shall hand you over to Tim. Or maybe Ryan, if we need him. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh. Where's Ryan? <laughs> oh, that's the guy from Ryan's mum, doing. <laughs> With a little further ado, we'll be hearing from Tim. Request. Request. Come and quit. Control Q. Personalizing. Yeah, I think we've already done it. Yeah. Oh, oh. I'm just going to get started talking. Um, the way I like to uh, organize my thoughts about scientific publishing, um, especially with respect to data, um, is around the idea of a wall. Um, is that in science we are uh, trying to build a wall of knowledge to get ever higher towards the gods, and in each little each little piece of information, each published paper is is a brick that's placed down on that wall and subsequent science comes along and builds on that wall. And of course the wall relies on the fact that the bricks underneath it are solid and it can tolerate a few bricks <coughs> crumbling and the wall will stay up. But if too many bricks in the wall crumble, then the wall will fall down. And um, And so, um, one of the key things with, with ensuring that this wall of scientific publication uh, persists and is able to support future research is ensuring that every single, um, every single brick or the vast majority of the bricks in that wall are solid. Okay, so these are all the people that contribute to this research. There's a solid wall, there's a wall that's fallen down. Um, and so science is the search for general rules about things and replication tests different circumstances that is we're testing the rule in many different in many different instances and um, then using that to uh, draw general conclusions about the nature of the world and reproducibility checks the existing results that is are the results presented in this paper actually uh, reasonable given what we know and we really much hope that bad papers will be spotted by the community and discarded but maybe many papers are wrong maybe um, the results in many papers and the conclusions drawn from those results are not particularly representative of reality and so um, we could hope that it's not true but it's actually better to try and quantify the rate at which papers don't really represent um, the, the results of papers that actually represent what the data say. So to do reproducibility analyses, uh, we need the original data from the paper. And so I'm just going to be talking for a few minutes about 
how to get hold of the, the challenges involved in getting hold of the original data underlying papers. Um, and then if you want to do reproducibility, you actually then need to reproduce reproduce the analysis, repeat them yourself. Um, and I don't actually have time to talk about the work we've done on that today. So first paper I wanted to talk about is how does the availability of data change with the time since publication? This is work that appeared in current biology at the beginning of last year. <coughs> so here's uh, Bill's very famous slide on um, his 1987 paper on when papers, uh, when a study is published, there is um, all the data is there present in the mind of the researcher, and over time uh, it starts to erode away all the information that's available. Um, minor details get lost, sometimes the computers get lost, um, sometimes the researcher leaves science and can no longer be contacted, and then at some point the researcher dies and all their research ends up in the thrift store and then it's generally considered lost at that point. So how fast does this happen? Are we talking about uh, a scale of 35 years um, from the publication of the study uh, to all the data related to that study being lost, or is it really happening over the course of decades? And on top of that, what are the main causes of data loss? Why is data getting lost? Why is it no longer available? And so here are the, the major causes, the, uh, the things which cause the entire data set to disappear that is there, either stored on a defunct format that nobody has a disk drive for anymore, um, someone's computer is stolen, that's the only copy of the data, um, uh, people change careers completely and they can no longer be contacted, and right at the end there's the final death where authors uh, are no longer available to be discussed. Um, and the way to address this is just to ask the data sets and see how many you get. So for this study, uh, we wanted first to be sure to control for data type. That is, um, uh, it's not quite fair to ask for, um, so we wanted to ask for data sets across a, a number of papers with a range of ages. So the very um, old, for very old papers and very new papers, and we needed to be asking for the same data type across all years, and you can't really use genetic data for that because genetic data um, in the last few years is orders of magnitude larger and more complicated than genetic data from 30 years ago, which you could probably put in the back of a postcard. And so we picked a type of data set that has been collected in exactly the same way for many years, and that these data sets are typically about the same size, between 100 and 400 individuals, and they're collected in exactly the same way. with binocular microscope with calipers, something like that. And so this is data that's been that's consistent over the years. And we also we controlled for data type. And we also stipulated that the data must have been used in a discriminant function analysis. Again, a very common analysis to apply to morphological data from plants and animals. And what it does is helps you split uh, known identify which um, of your measurements splits uh, the population into, into groups. And why do we stipulate that it had to be used in the DFA? Well, because these parts, if you, uh, if you lose these minor aspects of, um, of the data, the minor parts of the metadata, you can actually, in effect, lose the entire data. For example, if the author forgets to add column headings onto their data set uh, and then stores that, you really don't have any idea at all which the, what the columns mean. Um, and so the data set is more or less useless. And so the way to, to probe for these uh, minor errors, these minor losses of metadata, is to actually take the data and try and recreate one of the analyses so you can really tell whether it's all there or not. So we found 516 studies in the odd years between 1991 and 2011, and we uh, asked for data by email. We found emails in the paper and online. We did, if we couldn't rely just on the paper because papers from 1991 had no email addresses, papers from 2001 had email addresses in, but chances are they were all defunct. Um, 2011 would probably have up-to-date email addresses. So to control for that, we searched online as well for five minutes for each of the corresponding author, the last author, and the first author. And we asked them, we want to try repeating your DFA. We would like to try, we are doing a reproducibility study, and we want to try um, to recreate your discriminant function. And this gets to the point of author motivation to respond. So if we, 
um, if we gave them a very urgent reason why we needed their data, for example, your funding will be cut immediately if you don't provide this data set to us, um, we would get a lot of data sets. People would go to the ends of the earth, they're going to dig them out. Um, but if we gave them a very trivial reason, we would get very little. Um, and so our request is very common practice. And the previous study where we emailed authors and asked for data sets, we found somewhere between 20 and 50 percent is what we'd expect in terms of a response rate that leads to us getting data. And that would be for the most recent year. And then uh, presumably in the older, the older papers, we would get a lower response rate. So the motivation would set the total percentage of data sets we receive. Um, and our focus is on how percentage changes with time. So as long as we get some data right at the beginning, we're OK. And then if, they, if the data were gone, we asked for the reason. Why can't you send us the data? What's happened to it? These are the results. And I'm going to focus here on the probability that the data is still extend. That is, or sometimes authors said, yes, here's the data. Um, off you go. And sometimes they said, I have the data, but I'm not going to give it to you because I'm using it for something else, or it's, I, don't, I don't want to share it. And so uh, we didn't call people out on that and say, prove it that you have the data. We just accepted that it was true. Sometimes it seemed to be stretching reality a little bit, like there was a data set from 1991 that the authors claimed was still in active use and couldn't possibly be shared. Um, and that, that data set does actually skew the results quite a bit. Um, so I've caught concentrating the probability that the data are still extant. And so overall, this is what we see, the, um, the data, uh, the amount of data drops off from about 40% um, in 2011, so until uh, 20 years later, most of it is gone. And um, for the, the last two points there, 20 and 22, they're based on just three studies, one of which is that I still have it and I'm using it. So the odds of the data being extant fell by about 8% per year, and it was almost all gone after 20 years. Just three of the 61 data sets we asked for in 1991 and 1993 were available. Why were we unable to get the data? So this is where we start digging into it and finding out what the causes of um, data disappearing are. And that is, um, to put it a different way, which, um, which are related to paper age? Which are the reasons? Um, the data disappearing are, uh, show a, uh, a decline with, with time. So the probability that at least one email for the authors we contacted didn't bounce. So apologize for the convoluted wording, um, but that just means we tried emailing three, two, one, two, or three different people, and um, if at least one of the emails looked like it got through, then um, we assume, okay, we've, we've contacted somebody. Um, and so you can see that we start from about 80%. So even very new papers, we can't actually get through to 20% of people. None of the emails worked, even when the paper was two years old at that point. And then when we get down to the 1991 papers, um, even though we searched online for the most recent and up-to-date email address, we still um, could only find work emails for about 60% of people. And so given that we've got through to somebody, somebody related to the paper read our email, what's the probability that we actually got a response? And this, uh, very pleasingly, um, is 50% across the board. That means there was no relationship between the likelihood of responding to paper age. And so that means the motivation for people to respond was uh, fairly constant through time or was unrelated to the age of the paper. And this is a bit of a housekeeping one. Given that we did get a response, what's the probability that the author told us about the state of the data? Sometimes people responded and said, yeah, I'm off swimming, and I'm not gonna, I, I can't deal with this now. And they never re responded, and so that tells us nothing about whether the data was available or not, and so we sort of put those to one side. And then again, this category is not related to the age of the paper either. And then this is the one that got everyone's attention. So this is, given that we heard about the data, the author said either it is available or not available, or I'm still using it, what's the probability that it was still around? And it drops from 100% for uh, the most recent papers in 2011 down to 
18, 20%. And you can see the, the rightmost point, again, is inflated by this one study where they claimed they were still reusing using the data. It would be, would be down next to the other one. So, to conclude, data held by the authors disappears pretty quickly. It's almost all gone after 20 years. And of course, data that's 20 years old actually starts again, especially for ecological studies and evolutionary studies, starts to get really useful because now sufficient time has passed that you can expect there to be fairly substantial differences between what you saw then and what you'll see now. Um, and so it's uh, very unfortunate that almost all these data sets have now been, been lost. So archiving publication is really crucial, as you know. So now uh, I'm going to skip back in time to an earlier study we did where we looked at whether data archiving policy actually work. Say your journal saw the previous paper and thought, okay, let's put in, bring in a data archiving policy. What flavor of policy works? Um, and so uh, there are four flavors. Uh, no policy, uh, where you don't mention data archiving anywhere in your author guidelines at all. Um, you can recommend that the authors archive the data, you can tell them you think it's important and it should be available, or you can require, you say there's a condition of publication that your data is made available. And a uh, requirement actually has uh, two subcategories, um, that there is uh, no data availability statement or there is a data availability statement. And this is a mandatory statement that is present in the paper that says where the data are. So if the authors feel like they don't want to share the data, they're at least forced to state, we don't want to share our data on the paper. And that's, um, as you'll see, quite an effective law mechanism. And so again, we focused on a single type of data. We didn't want to be um, looking at multiple data types and having that muddying our um, ability of our studies to draw conclusions. And we, uh, for this study, we focused on the genetic data used in structure. Uh, this is a very common data type in the journal I work on, molecular ecology. And it must uh, have an established online archive there. Reasonably, if you've got a data policy saying it must be put somewhere on an archive as supplemental material, there needs to be somewhere for it reasonably to go. Um, and Dryad is the natural place for these data and has been recommended um, in, the in the journal policies that do mention uh, what people should do with their data. They almost all pointed to Dryad for evolutionary and ecological data. So that meant that authors are being given explicit guidelines on what they should be doing with it as well. So we found 20, uh, this is a study that just for a single time period, which was 2011, 2012, and we found 229 papers that filled our criteria. And what percentage of these had that data available? And so on the left, where you don't mention data archiving at any point, proportion of data sets that's voluntarily and spontaneously made available is very low indeed, um, no one more than 10%. If you recommend um, that the that authors archive the data, that doesn't seem to act as a very strong spur for them to do anything. Um, if you require data archiving, um, that is with using the JDAP policy, such as Journal of Evolutionary Biology, Evolution, Heredity, and Electropology brought in, you get quite a bit more data. Um, and a data statement uh, is actually very effective. And molecular ecology is a bit of an outlier here because we also have quite a bit of enforcement. Heredity told me that, in fact, they have really very little um, active checking of uh, the data archiving statement. But still, even with this statement, they have uh, a pretty high rate. And it's, uh, it's only seven studies, but um, I think it's indicative that something is going on there. So now I sort of want to get a bit more freeform and talk about motivating archiving. Like uh, at Molecular Ecology, we've been sort of trying a number of levers to persuade authors to spontaneously archive their data, to spontaneously do a good job with it. And so there's a wide range of approaches available. Um, first, you could just say, you must archive your data, or you should archive your data. Next, you could actually check whether any data is there and say, you haven't archived any data, therefore, you know, if it's a condition of publication, you have to put something on there. Or you could check whether all the data is there, that is, check what's in, what data sets are created in the paper and which data sets are present in their data statement or which data sets are present on triad, for example. 
um, you can try and reproduce some basic values. Uh, you can check whether the data that are presented in the paper actually match the data that are online. Um, or you can actually go completely gung-ho and try to recreate all the results in the paper from start to finish, which is quite the undertaking. So the last three are pretty much what we're going to be talking about this afternoon, so we can grade them out. But these are our experiences with the first three and molecular college if you decide to start right from the beginning. So the easy steps. But one is data statements, and I think these are a really nice, simple way for journals to motivate authors to archive their data um, because it forces them to state publicly whether or not they're going to comply with the policy or not. And so um, the perfect being the enemy of the good, it makes them put at least a little bit of their data or a substantial fraction of the, the key data in their paper online. It may not motivate them to put it all there, but even if there's a data statement, they have to say what they're doing with it. And so um, an often great opportunity to test uh, the effectiveness of data statements. And in fact, also a strengthened policy came up when PLOS One brought in the new policy in March 2014, which did require a data statement appear in the paper. And that, um, and then so I actually went back and re-examined a number of the, um, well not re-examined, I examined papers submitted to PLOS after that date and that had the data statement in and examined what proportion of the structured data sets um, were now available, it leaps up to 40%. So that's uh, a good sign that data statements are an effective way of pushing authors to archive the data. Um, and one thing we found in molecular ecology is the earlier in the, the, earlier in the process that you do it, um, the, the less hassle it is. So you tell authors it has to be in the, in the paper at initial submission, and that gets them thinking about data archiving before that, whilst they're writing up the paper. Um, and it also um, emphasizes that data archiving is part of the submission and review process. It's not some minor policy compliance thing at the end. It's actually an integral part of it. Your data are going to be put alongside your paper all the way through. Um, linking archiving to data quality, this is a sort of heuristic tool. Um, you add the expectations of the author guidelines. Again, very easy. You just put something like this in your study, in your author guidelines. Papers with exemplary data and code archiving are more valuable for future research, which I think is obviously true, and all else being equal, these are more likely to get accepted for publication. That just motivates authors who are doing everything they can to get published to have, um, to have the data there. Medium steps. Um, we can ask the reviewers to assess the data statement that, and let authors know that the data statement is going to be assessed. This is asking them to check whether the data accessibility statement or the data statement lists all the data sets present in the paper. Um, and we're giving the options of saying, yes, no, I didn't check. Um, and we find that only 15% provide good feedback, and this has been a disappointment to us. We thought reviewers would be a little more diligent in checking this. My, I suspect that they don't actually quite understand what we're asking them to do, because a number of them say, I tried to go onto Dryad and look at the data, but it wasn't there. Um, and that's because they don't have the, an easy way of accessing it at the moment. And so I think if we can maybe fix that, then this percentage will go up. Um, we can ask the data, the editors to assess the data statement. We don't do this in molecular ecology. We've talked about it at editorial board meetings, and there's a bit of resistance from them. And so we feel they're doing a lot for us already, and we don't want them to, to push them any harder. So they could include the comments on data archiving in the decision letter. Harder steps, um, we have the editorial office check the data statement. And this would involve somebody going through the paper and comparing it to the data sets listed in the data statement and working out whether or not they've provided all the data they ought to have provided. Um, and if the editorial office is doing this, we found that you really can't um, drop it for some papers or um, you have to be consistent. You have to do it for all of them or none of them. And it does require a PhD in that field to do this because it's very complicated and it's, you need familiarity with the kind of data sets that are being produced in order to do this. It's effective. Um, as the, graph, the bar chart from microecology showed that you can get a very high proportion of the data sets this way. Um, lastly, bring in data reviewers. This is where we're going to um, talk about this afternoon. Um, 
And so if you leave that, we haven't tried this in microbiology. And then we have Chuck Norris level steps. Um, and then we do full tests for reproducibility. Only fanatics and masochists may attempt this before. Yeah, and it would certainly motivate or terrify authors into submission if they knew that paper was going to be completely gone through and repeated. Anyway, I'd like to thank these people who helped with the data collection of the first few things. Thank you, this is a very nice overview. I have a question on the table that gives differences between the number of data uh, made available versus mandates or recommendations, etc. Apparently, uh, authors need a mandate before they do it. They need to be mandated before they do it. Um, what do you think would hold them to do it just? I think they feel that they feel that publication isn't enough for a hassle already. They're doing so they've worked on these papers for years and just like, oh God, really another thing we have to do. They may also feel that data sets aren't really in a state to be shared and they don't want to go to the trouble of fixing them up, which is a perfect reason to make them do it, because to be honest, they have to um if the data sets aren't in a very good shape, you know, there's probably mistakes in the paper as it is. So um it's a good reason to motivate them to do it. Yes, to what extent could um, the repositories be involved in kind of validation of data? So, for example, um, you know, um, PDB, the structural database, um, there's a validation process there. So part of your review is actually done by the database. Um, I was almost going to mention this. Um, I think the answer of sort of data checking is going to have to be done in the future by robots taking the paper, looking at the data, doing calculations, and working out whether the data is there or not. And that's the easy way to do that because it's very labor intensive to do it any other way, especially if all journals start doing this. It's going to take a lot more time. So I, I'm very interested in this slide as well because um, when I was at Plot, there was a debate about having say availability statements. The idea was that Plot One would not be able to check every single statement, but just having them would help. Um, and really, you're you're saying that's absolutely the case, and that journals should not be put off asking for data availability statements by the work required to check those statements. Because just having the statement really helps. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, both of your presentations there really come across as very striking and strong endorsements for things like Dryad, Orchid, DataSite, a whole number of different solutions. Based on your work, though, uh, are there any potential informatic solutions that might be missing? Um, well, yeah, I think I think we need to enable um, review of data. So, I mean, uh, I'll be talking to probably Brian a bit later about where the molecular ecology getting the data into a reviewer's hands who want to look at it is not as smooth as it should be, and that's sort of stumbling between Scholar One and between Triad, and that um, that's easy to fix. Um, but ultimately, I think if we're going to move to expecting um, or checking data more thoroughly, then I think we're going to need some sort of automated systems to do it, some sort of AI. And it's, that's not impossible. I mean, computers can read things pretty well, we think. Yes, time for one more thing from David, or maybe a quick one. Thank you. Does uh, data are available upon request to count as a data statement? And if not, um, how do you spell that out to your authors? Um, that does not count as a data statement. That counts as a, I mean, we, we often respond to that, well, okay, great. Um, and when you're dead, who can we contact? 
um, or, you know, it's quite say that, but we say in 20, 30 years' time, if we want the data, who should we contact? And that also gets them to think, oh, you know, I have it now, but chances are I'm going to lose it. So we, uh, we don't accept that at all. Um, thank you for a fantastic uh, study of, of data and what data is available, etc. cetera. Um, interesting point, you said that the researchers are all that are having enough trouble, all the things they have to do, and, and what we need to do is to make it easier for all of us to write things. Um, but also for data, this gives them um, a tool, online tools, to actually put data right at the beginning to support them from the start. So when they want to share, they press the button. You know what format is coming, rather than having having in some sort of form they think oh it's not ready. Yeah, I think that some sort of step where your data statement is actually linked in the paper to the data set. So say we click this data set and then that links to the data statement, that links to the data set to, to really join the paper and those things together. But yes, and the way that would happen is that the authors have prepared those links in advance and bring them into the paper. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tim. Next, I don't think I should be trusted with this. Uh, next, we have Brooks. Let me try. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to so um, in starting, let me just add an anecdote to amplify what a personal anecdote that that um, to amplify what Tim said about who four months ago um, a close colleague asked for um, the data from my postdoc research, which let's just say be generous was 20 years ago, and. Um, so it's within Tim's timeline, and and I go, oh, well, you know, that's interesting. And I actually had a floppy disk. This is a, a geochemical, a whole bunch of geochemical major and trace element data from a field site in the eastern Sierra Nevada. And I actually had a had a floppy disk, loaded it up, looked at my computer. It was in Excel 1.0. Um, it turns out that Excel 2013 or 2015 or whatever doesn't read Excel 1.0. Um, and so I was stuck, but uh, was actually able to start up an old Mac SE30, which is also about 20 years old, which is running Excel 4.0, and actually able to convert that to a CDS file and then send it on. To it. So I guess that would be something that's barely available um, data, and all of it worked. It's like the, the drive, the, the floppy disk drive worked, and the hard drive on the on the Mac that I hadn't started up for 15 or 20 years actually worked. So. Kind of uh, strange. Anyway, so I want to talk a little bit about what um, we're doing at AGU um, recently and the, the history of, of um, uh, kind of publishing data at AGU, and then more broadly, um, an effort we've um, been part of across the Earth and space sciences called um, COPDES. We couldn't think, we're not smart enough like the military to think of a really good acronym, so this stands for Coalition on Publishing Data in the Earth and Space Sciences. Um, and what um, what we've done um, within that group and a recent conference uh, that AGU, AAAS, and actually is led by AAAS and the Ecological Society uh, had on reproducibility of field data um, just two weeks ago, ten days ago, something like that, and some outcomes from that. Um, so AGU is the largest publisher in the Earth and Space Sciences. Um, we have 19 journals, publish about 6,000 papers a year. Um, the kind of the joke I make is that Elsevier may have a few more titles, but who really cares? Um, well, for some time I'm going to say that, and there's going to be someone from Elsevier in here in the room that will get mad at me, but that's the sour Um So uh, data at AGU. AGU is actually one of the first societies to have a data policy statement in 1993. You can look it up on Wikipedia, and everybody believes Wikipedia, so I do. Um, this was uh, when the, uh, essentially just when the World Wide Web started. And most journals weren't even on publishing online until 95, 96. 
Um, we were archiving uh, data in microfiche at that time. Um, one of my headaches now as director of publications is we still get requests for those microfiche data and we have to go find it somewhere. In some cases, we have to go to other libraries and say, please send us back the data that we archived with you um, and get it that way. And in some cases, we don't have it. Um, we actually had a society position statement in 1997 that's been updated several times since then. A, a current um, slight revision of that is in draft waiting for council approval. Um, we hope to have it later this year, early next year through council. But basically, every statement since uh, 1997 has recognized the inherent value of earth and space science data um, and that it's important um, both for science and for society issues, and it should be archived. Um, while they're, you know, most both of those policies were pretty much aspirational in 2014, um, we kind of put a very firm policy through our council that required data archiving, um, and took a number of steps in in the publications to enforce that, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, uh, which I'll talk about now, and then show the implications in a minute. We required a specific statements and acknowledgments. We added very specific questions to the reviewers to check that the data were appropriate um, to support the major conclusions. Um, um, checklists uh, for authors to answer on submission. It's not just a click through, but they actually have to, to clarify where their data are um, as part of the submission process. Um, and a variety of FAQs. Um, we also started a new journal, Earth and Space Science, in 2015, um, which includes in its mandate the ability to take papers describing data sets and methodologies. In other words, uh, they don't, we're not requiring a major or shattering conclusion, which is what our other journals required. But um, the goal of this was in part to um, um, expose um, very important earth science data kind of um, meeting the, the data position statement and provide credit for authors for generating important data sets. Um, so some of the impacts, um, we've gotten a lot of questions from authors and editors and reviewers about this, and much of our discussions with our editors is how we're going to enforce the policy. Um, there's gen general compliance. Um, most of our complaints we, we included in our data policy code related to uh, understanding the final data sets, and so I would say many of the kind of pushback we've had for the, the creative complaints we've had from the from authors have involved code, um, as well as, you know, do you really want all of my data? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we've actually rejected some papers essentially at submission for failure to provide data. Um, we initially got a lot of um, data available from author statements and are uh, re-educating our community that those are not acceptable. Um, so let me just back up and talk some larger, this larger effort we have uh, going on in the earth and space sciences. And I think I'd like to also include a couple um, areas to, you know, challenge Dryad or, or, or where I think Dryad can share some leadership given um, it's kind of greater longevity in this issue and connection to a variety of um, communities um, and, and kind of the leadership that's already shown in, in some of the resources and working with journals. Um, so from a publisher's perspective, many have had supplements uh, for some time. As I mentioned with Microfish, the, the journals hate doing this. Um, uh, the, you know, I always describe this as we do a really piss poor job of, of um, archiving. It's in PDF. It's not scrollable. There's no metadata, um, et cetera. Um, we know it. Um, we want to do a better job, but we don't have a great way of doing that, um, which is, of course, one of the, the great things about uh, Dryad. Um, we're requiring authors to comply with data availability uh, and policing. I will say an anecdote. I was just at the CSC meeting. And at an editor's breakfast with you know, 19, 20 other uh, major journal editors, all of who were from biomedicine. I was the only physical science editor there, and, and we kind of had a show of hands of who has data compliance statements, and our mine was the only hand up. So I think there's very different communities. I was very surprised at that. that there are so many uh, biomedical journals that do not have um, data compliance statements. Anyway. 
Um, there's little guidance on community standards. Those are developing, but we need to step that up. Um, journals want to promote repositories, but they're not well integrated except for a few exceptions, Dryad kind of being one. Um, and uh, journals are very worried about funding of repositories, and we've seen way too many examples where we've encouraged data to go into an archive only to find that that funding has gone, for that archive has gone belly up. Um, I think Nature did a, a news story a little while ago that found basically 50% of the repositories are struggling for funding. Um, the data repositories, they want it. They want the data. They want to uh, allow better science. That's really part of their mission. Um, uh, in response to a question someone asked earlier, um, I do think that repositories have a key role in data quality. Um, that's true of several of the major repositories in the Earth and Space Sciences, IRIS, for example, on seismologic data, uh, MAGIC for paleomagnetic data. They, they ensure metadata standards. They ensure the uh, correct data format. And that's a really valuable service that in some ways can help the peer review process and help the efficiency of the peer review process. But there's still poor connection to publications. It's often ad hoc. Um, and uh, at least the domain repositories complain that they're not getting all the data that would make those data sets and those repositories really valuable. So um, what we decided to do was work across the earth sciences and um, recognize that publication is a key value point of exposing data because of the data publication requirements. Um, figure out a way to connect publishers with domain repositories and use the connection to actually help everyone, help the authors, help, help the repositories, and help the publishers. So essentially, it's a win-win-win proposition. Uh, because if authors know what they have to do way early in the process, they avoid that frustration with right when their paper is getting accepted or submitted, trying to figure out a whole bunch of um, regulations, essentially. So we had a meeting um, in uh, late last year at AGU where we brought together kind of all the major publishers from the Earth and Space Sciences, major data repositories, and major funders, um, at least the major U.S. funders, NASA, NOAA, NSF, DOE, NRL, et cetera, were there, uh, ONR, sorry, and um, we, to, to get these groups to connect and figure out a process for how we can make these connections and um, use that uh, to improve, to, well, to help the publishers, to help the repositories, and help, help the authors. Um, so, you know, you can see the back of Todd Carpenter from NISO, John Vandekar from Nature, from the Wiley Group, actually some Dan Lovegrove from Elsevier and others uh, trying to figure this process out. So we came up with um, a statement of commitment uh, between the publishers and the data repositories um, to facilitate um, this exchange of data. Um, and it includes, you know, Earth and Space Science data should, to the greatest extent possible, be stored in appropriate domain repositories that follow leading practices and can provide additional data services. Um, and this is one of the areas where I think, I think Dryad can show some uh, particular leadership in helping this. Um, and, and, and I guess the question to pose the Dryad leadership is how, how to connect the important data that's in Dryad to those domain repositories where it can be particularly valuable for um, search and discovery and uh, further um, analysis. And so that's one question that I hope, I hope Dry I can show some leadership in and, and also in sharing or perhaps leading in many of the tools that Dryad has already developed to work with publishers um, to help some of the domain repositories do the same thing. So this statement of commitment was released on 15 January. There's an article in EOS, if you go to that, um, copdesk.org website, you'll see both of those, um, as well as the signatories, which I'll show in a minute. Um, we also have a number of actions. Um, one is to build an online directory of data repositories that can be used by all the publishers, so that's a kind of a single shopping for authors. Um, this is, uh, we're working now with Center for Open Science. Um, I'm not sure if Ryan will talk more about it in his keynote but we're nearing development of that and hope to have it available for publishers to use um, in a few months. So the idea is that all the, all the major publishers can point to a single directory um, where uh, authors can find the right repository to put any particular type of data. Um, it will allow endorsement of repositories by publishers. 
and general descriptions of the repositories, links to, from the repositories about metadata information and other things to help authors comply. And since um, all the publishers are going to be using it, it uh, makes it very efficient for authors, and we hope that that will um, promulgate kind of um, general standards and workflows earlier in the process. Um, we're doing some other efforts to align journal publishers' policies for open data. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we've had a few papers rejected for our not meeting our data compliance. Um, I think it's in everyone's best interest not to have a low, um, low standard journal where everyone can go, go to and, and escape other policies. Um, so the signatories, um, right now we have most of the major uh, publishers in the Earth and Space Sciences. Um, many of the major um, repositories, including Dryad, thank you. Um, if you prefer logos, <laughs> there's lots of them. Um, and so I, I think this is a, a, a community effort that um, I think our next challenge is, is actually changing some of the, the author culture and recognizing the value of, um, of enabling this, this type of workflow. Um, a couple other things I want to just, just close with. As I mentioned, we just had a, a meeting following up this earlier meeting on reproducibility in the field sciences, spanning earth and space sciences and ecology, um, evolutionary biology, things like that. Uh, Cliff from ESA was there, as I mentioned. ESA was a co-sponsor of it. Um, and one of the outcomes was to align um, kind of the, the statement of commitment, which is kind of an operational statement of commitment, with um, an earlier output um, that the, that AAAS and the Center for Open Science um, developed as a result of an earlier conference called the Top Guidelines for Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines for Journal Practices. Um, I hope Brian will talk about this uh, briefly in his uh, talk after lunch, um, but there is, it's at the Center for Open Science website. And these are kind of more, um, kind of a maturity model, if you will, for data curation in journals. So similar to what um, Tim had talked about, but, but a, a level of steps that, that can kind of guide journals for um, various data compliance um, standards or efforts in, in their data policies. So top is a little bit more strategic. Um, the COP, the COP desk statement commitment is a little more operational. So one of the outcomes um, from this conference was to kind of align and join these efforts with specifically for field samples, also emphasizing the use of IGSNs. Sorry, there's a typo there. It's I, IGSNs for samples, International uh, Geo Sample Network um, um, for uh, labeling, it's, a, it's a, a way of labeling samples and registering samples that allows them to be identified across um, publications. So if someone is doing a reanalysis on the same sample, it, it allows uh, linking of those publications. Um, so very important in kind of field reproducibility and, um, and, and advancing further field science. So the last thing I want to talk about is where also I think um, Dryad and the other repositories that people are going to show leadership, and that's one of the biggest complaints or feedback we've been getting from authors, which is what, you want all my data? Um, what's happening, uh, what this graph shows kind of poorly, I, I, I'm amused because it shows that we collected, if you, if you believe this graph, it's that we actually collected no data before 2010, which isn't quite true. Uh, but what it basically shows is that we're collecting a lot more data today in, in science then we can store. There, there's many fields of science that throw away the data almost immediately as collected. And, you know, one of the prime examples is uh, one of the major discoveries on the Higgs boson. Um, they actually had detectors on their experiments that would detect whether that experiment might have a detection of a Higgs in it. And if it didn't, they basically threw away the petabytes of data that they were getting because they just couldn't uh, store them. Um, the same thing is true with genome data. Many of the raw genome reads are are gone um, essentially as soon as they're collected. It's a process data that, that um, we use. That's true in, in planetary science which, and, and much of astronomy. We're collecting way too much data that can be stored, and certainly that can be transmitted. And, sir, and I think the guidance that the community needs in many cases will come to repository, from the repositories is I think the repositories understand 
best or can guide the community, in some cases, the best on which data are the most important. It can help provide guidance to the journals um, who are wrestling um, with this in that by saying, yes, these are the types of data that are most important for both reproducibility and for further advancing science. So again, I think that's some place where um, Dryad and the other repositories can take um, a very good leadership role. Thank you. had a policy, uh, actually, as I mentioned, the policy extended back to um, 1993. And so there was, you know, some fairly broad compliance before then, um, but there wasn't as strictly enforced editorially. So we have not um, thought yet about going back and trying to figure out um, uh, which papers were fully compliant and not many were fully compliant. Um, and, and part of that also depended on the maturity of the available repositories. For example, most of the seismological papers were compliant because um, IRIS, the main seismological repository, has been operating for quite a while and is essentially a community standard there for 10 years or so. Um, so we haven't thought about it. We are, you know, when we get requests, so where we've been doing it is when we get requests from um, researchers that say, hey, I've been reading this paper and I would like the data behind it. And then we're going back to the authors and saying, well, you know, our data policy since 1993 said <laughs> it should be available. But there was a lot less kind of supervision by the editors and reviewers that every paper complied. I don't think you mentioned before something about the basic principles. Can you say anything about those? Yep. So they, they are part. Um, they are our standards. So, in as part of our um, guidelines for authors in our 2014 data policy, we um, require Force 11 data citation where possible. Um, and part of, uh, and the statement of commitment between the Earth and Space Science publishers um, and COPDES, there's a specific mention of following Force 11. As 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 a requirement. Okay. I have one question yep. for you, Brooks, and that's whether um, your experience at ATU of asking reviewers to check manuscripts for data accessibility um, compared to Tim's experience at molecular ecology, where only 50 percent of the reviews are helpful in that. Um, I think it's it's pretty similar. We are seeing a lot of reviews mention it now. Um, and that's you know that's where I think the editors are giving feedback and and so forth. So, but I, I also suspect that there are several times when reviewers are not mentioning that it's just glossed over in, in a variety of ways. Um, and I think that's why we're also doing it very strictly at submission and and just trying to kind of lay, raise the level of awareness throughout the process, both as, as I mentioned to our editors as far as looking at it, the the reviewers and. And in some sense, you just need one of three reviewers um, <laughs> to do it right. So, um, you know, as long as, as one of three says it's, it says it's okay, that's better than um, none. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, please cut the last piece of your question. Hello, good morning. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me here. My name is Eva Smith. I work for the uh, International Association of STM Publishers, and I would like to add a little more on the publisher's perspective on around data and everything that's happening there. Um, 
just to quickly introduce our organization, it's a member organization with more than 125 uh, publishing organizations as a member, and we assemble all sorts, shapes, and sizes. We have the very big ones, the very small ones, the very profitable ones, the non-profit ones, the open access publishers, university presses, societies, etc., etc. And in total, they publish roughly two thirds of uh, of the uh, <coughs> publications in the world. Now, I would like to give you a little tour around the horizon of what publishers are doing with data and what they have been doing recently with data. It's really some random examples. If you look at more publishers, I could probably fill the whole day with all kinds of examples, but I just took out a few of them, uh, and of course some of them that I really like as examples. Uh, here's, for example, some of the stuff that Nature has been doing, and I'll give you three examples a bit along the line. If you see at the top left, that was Nature in 2001 when they published the human genome in a special issue. And you see, it was a huge issue. The left page, not readable, but it's a long list of names of all the contributors. I think half the issue was filled with a list of contributors. And you see, this was really sort of the first indication that we were reaching the ultimate stretch of the paper printing uh, era because it needed a lot of fallouts to uh, to give all the graphs and the data, etc., etc. Ten years later, when the um, uh, genome was uh, celebrating its 10th anniversary, everything was already electronic with direct links to MRI archives, etc., etc. And last year, Nature made the next step and they launched a special publication, a special journal about uh, data papers, data reproduction. And we actually have the editor in chief here in the room, right, Susanna? <laughs> okay, so this is what Nature has been doing. I have another example of the EMBO journal in microbiology. They've been very active in adding uh, data behind graphs in collapsible sections behind tables, et cetera, et cetera. You see that on the top two uh, slides. And also what they do is they tag uh, entities within the article. You see all the colorful highlights. And from there, you can make direct links to GenBank and look up the, uh, all the data behind the tagged entities. So there you can go from the, from the paper immediately to the data behind it in some of the big archives. Here is an Elsevier example. Elsevier is now working with something like 40 or 50 data archives, and they've put a lot of effort in making the data interactionable in the paper. And for that, they employ data viewers. You see different data viewers, for example, uh, on the left bottom side, there's one in astronomy. So you can look up the data that was used for the paper in a data viewer, and the data viewer also gives you different uh, varieties of the format in which you want to see the paper. The same, uh, for example, for the molecular structures here on the right-hand side. If you click on different tabs, you get them in different dimensions and in different representation modes, uh, etc., etc. So here are some examples in astronomy, in, I think, left on top is the protein database, here's something on, um, on plants and uh, animals databases, etc., etc. So this is a way to make the data interactionable for the reader, for the researcher, when he's reading a paper and he thinks, well, what is this data exactly around about and what if I what to look at it in the way I always look at it, etc., etc. Then there's a long list of examples, and I want to give a few examples here, of publishers and data centers that are working together. And of course, Dryad, which you all know because otherwise you wouldn't be here, is a very good example on the top left side. There's also the Kika database in Beijing, um, who publishes their own journal with uh, Biomed Central. Uh, here on the left bottom side are the examples of Pangea, which also create interactive maps with related data in the same area, et cetera, et cetera. So you can jump from one data set to another data set. And there are also 
some of the first big data examples where they have links to uh, open fMRI and where they put source codes in GitHub so that people can really, um, uh, yeah, re yeah re work on reproducibility, but also look at the analysis programs that they use. And you can say, well, let's put my data in their program or let's uh, uh, put their program on my data, etc. So, there are many ways in which publishers are exploring uh, how they can facilitate data publishing, how they can enrich articles for readers, for researchers, how to work on repro reproducibility, and maybe you now think, yeah, but what is really the way to do it? Why is there so much diversity? And um, we tried to capture that diversity a few years ago in the following pyramid, which we call the Data Publication Pyramid. It was developed in the context of an EU project in which we were a partner. And um, basically, if people ask why is there so much diversity in the way data gets published, it is because there's so much diversity in different types of data. You know, there's data, there's data, and there's data. And that is what this um, pyramid tries to express. Because um, if you go, uh, let's start at the top. You know, publications with data, of course, are nothing new. Publications were always based on data, but in the past, in a very aggregated form. You know, it would just be one picture, one table with the most important data, and the data that was uh, that had, you know, where the statements and the assertions are, are based on. So, publications always had data. Uh, at the same time, and then we jump down to the base of the pyramid, uh, there's a lot of raw data that never gets published. I think the estimates now are that two-thirds or even three-quarters of the data never uh, gets out of the, uh, gets a, uh, further than the desk of the researcher or stays in the drawer or on a hard disk or, uh, or whatever. But of course, the two layers in between are where we see most of the things happening now. Because um, they, they also indicate the level of processing and, and uh, analyzing that happens to the data. For example, the second layer from the bottom is where data collections and structured databases have appeared. And like GenBank, Protein Database, Pangea, uh, and that's where people can find data that they can actually reuse. A lot of data uh, has for a long time stayed in, in the layer uh, a little bit above, uh, which were just supplementary files to articles. And the speaker before me already pointed out how dangerous that is, because they're usually not very discoverable, they're not well preserved, it is very difficult to really interpret them, etc., etc. So, if you now look at the pyramid and the relationship of the different layers with publications, then you can say publications will always have data. But there's now far more, the far more opportunities and far more possibilities to really do something with the data. You saw the interactive data viewers, you saw the collapsible sections. Uh, so, there's, there are many more ways to integrate the data uh, with the publication and to go into deeper level. My own expectation is that the second level of supplementary files to articles, that they will disappear, that that layer will become smaller and smaller, uh, and that more and more of that will move to organized data collections like Dryad or the other larger archives, etc., etc. And then let's also hope that the lowest layer of data that never sees the daylight, or not very far, that that also shrinks. So, uh, in a way, and you see that in the boxes next to the picture, from the data collections and the structured databases, you'll see a lot more linking to articles. you see also more big data, even in unprocessed forms, being pushed to the web or to uh, sites where you can share it with others. And also, of course, the new phenomenon is the data publications that describe available data sets and that will make it easier for others to reuse data. So, that is the data publication pyramid. 
And I now want to show you another picture, and that has to do with the technology trends. Uh, oh, let me see. Oh, this one doesn't quite work, does it? No, oh, that's a pity, because it was, <laughs> it was uh, a rather important feature. Uh, Todd, is there any way to repair it? Sorry? No, I just moved to the next picture. No. Yeah, but okay, I'll skip it. Uh, what I wanted to show you is uh, the technology trends that we as STM publish every year, and I wanted to show you how prominent data publishing is in it this year. This is really new compared to what we uh, found in other years, and I have here a little summary of it because this expresses the three main trends that we found, or that we identified, and the first one is that data is more and more recognized as a first-class research object. The second one is that the article will become more an element in a hub and spoke model. And the third one is reputation management. And reputation management that will be based on more than just uh, somebody's publication tracker. A track record, sorry. And the interesting thing about the three trends of this year is that they are so very closely interrelated. Because data as a first class research object and publishing data to enhance reproducibility, uh, to work along funder mandates, uh, those are all the movements that publishers have started working on. I showed you some of the examples. Uh, what it really needs is proper citation uh, procedures and, and practices, and also a very good linking between data and publications. Now, if you can imagine a future, or a future actually is happening today already, but if you can imagine that there's a growth in articles that link to data and data that link to articles, then you can also start thinking of other research outputs that will be linked between each other and linked to articles. And that is where we move to the second uh, trend, and that is the article in a hub and spoke model. And then you, then we probably need to start thinking beyond research data, but all kind of research outputs uh, that are possible, but also um, all kind of digital outputs that are related to the research, like uh, uh, meetings or um, videos or blogs or discussions or you know a, a myriad of things uh, can occur there and then the third trend has to do with the reputation management of researchers because of course for a very long time it was based solely and dominantly on somebody's publication track record but if more and more of these new elements text and non-text start appearing, and you also want to measure those kind of research outputs and express them in, uh, uh, in somebody's uh, reputation, and, and you see the odd metrics, the new metrics, et cetera, et cetera, uh, coming up. Okay, uh, what I would have been able to show you, I hope I can, oh gosh, what happened here? Oh. <laughs> Maybe if we reset it, we can get the, the the other picture back. Yeah. You still a technology optimist? Less so now, <laughs> <laughs> but it may come back oh. after Superman learning. Go up one, uh, try that one, maybe it now works. Yeah, gosh, sometimes it's good to have a failure because you come back better. This is, uh, this is 
what the, the picture that was sort of central in my talk, so I was a little bit disappointed that I couldn't show it to you, but at least we've got it back. Well done, Bob. <laughs> um, so this is um, how the three trends interrelate, and as you can see, each of them are driven by all kinds of other movements, trends, developments, etc. And the red area is everything about research data, and we can see it happening now, you know, the time is now for that. The article in the Happen Spot model is probably a bit further out, because this might start to happen, uh, but we're, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's still more in a starting phase. And vegetation management, we, see, we also see the first uh, element there. And, uh, you know, you see art metrics, you see funders, you see tenure requirements changing slightly. All those things you would find in the smaller wheels that drive the bigger trends, if you could read them, uh, which you can't hear. <laughs> but I want to zoom in, because we're talking about data here, uh, to the red area. And here you see the wheels that drive the data. The top one, maybe still not completely legible, but uh, it says create open science. That is, of course, really a big driver between data publishing. The one at one o'clock says linking articles and data with all kinds of initiatives and, and uh, uh, init yeah, initiatives taking place. The one on the left at 11 o'clock is about data management services because you can imagine that people will want data management services, the authors or the researchers who want to deposit data, but also the researchers who want to reuse data, you know, how to make them discoverable, how to find them. Uh, the wheel here at 8 or 9 o'clock is about trustworthy data centers. Uh, I heard one of the speakers say this morning, uh, the stability and the sustainability of repositories is a real concern. So you want trustworthy data centers. Also, as publishers, we would want it. You know, we want we would like to say to authors, choose whatever repository you like, but please choose them from this list, or please make sure they've been certified or whatever. And then there's some concerns also about openness of data and about reproducibility. Is reproducibility really possible? But also, can we protect the researcher? Some researchers have fear of being out of school, so they don't want to share their data too early. Is there a way that they can get the credits and that the publication with the data uh, can protect them uh, uh, for being recognized as the, as the source of the data as generator? of the data. And the, the blue and the green areas have similar wheels around them that drive these trends. Now you think, how did we make this up? We do this uh, with the input from our members. Uh, every year we do an annual brainstorm uh, with the main SPM publishers there. This year we had the input, you see it on the pictures, of 26 different organizations. We used the Delphi method, which is a uh, methods for technology forecasting once developed by, I think, either the Pentagon or the CIA. Uh, we do it, of course, for far more peaceful uh, uh, purposes. But <laughs> this is just to show you that it was an inclusive um, exercise to come to these trends. And it also means that a lot of publishers are ready and, and eager to embark uh, into these areas. I see I have only one minute left. So really quickly going to take you to two slides that I want to show you. Uh, we're also very active in the Research Data Alliance and in the CoData and WDS uh, circles. And one of the projects we're working on there is has to do everything with linking and citation between data and publications. And of course, if you see the picture on the left where the dark um, which is uh, octagonals or whatever they are, as publishes, bibliometrics, data centers, and right now every initiative depends on uh, a bilateral collaboration between these parties. And of course, there are more and more parties being active. There's so many data centers, there's so many publishers. What we really strive for is a system like that, where you have a very central way in which 
in a very automatic way, publications and data can get linked. So that is one of the big initiatives that we're working on uh, there. And I think it will be crucial to make data publishing uh, more effective. Uh, and this is my last slide. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is to show you that there are more issues to solve than linking, although I think that linking is really the first big step because it's also such an important step to make data discoverable and findable and understandable because, you know, what is the data if you don't know about the research projects uh, around it? It really needs a narrative somewhere, but there are more issues to solve than linking. So within RDA, we have a few more groups and some people in this room are very active in those groups. We have one on workflows, that's in the green one, workflows for archiving data. Uh, the costs of publishing data and how to recover those costs, bibliometrics on data, which also is important for reputation management, and data publication services, which is mainly about that sort of central linking uh, mechanism. Okay, that was it. Questions? Right, I shall take the opportunity oh. to ask you because our first two speakers spoke a lot about the, the involvement with authors and the challenges for authors in getting data out there. You've shown us some really nice examples of what publishers are doing to get readers engaging with data. Are publishers telling you anything about how readers are interacting with those new services they're providing? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, see, I get the impression that uh, many of them, this is a very honest answer, <laughs> that many of them uh, uh, invent and uh, develop a lot of exciting stuff, but that usage of uptake is still low. What I do hear is that the data viewers are very popular because a true, a genuine researcher, if he sees somebody else's data, uh, their first instinctive reflex seems to be uh, what does that data mean to what I'm doing? Can I put that data into my project, software, uh, whatever? Or how does it compare to my data? So the fact that they can work with it is very important. Uh, the EMBO journal that I showed is a, is a very simple need that a lot of readers have because in the past, Often, if they only had a little uh, illustration or a graph, you know, I can even remember from the print era where people would take out their article, uh, the reading now, um, yeah, their ruler, yes, and start measuring what, <laughs> you know, what the graph exactly said. So, you know, having a simple click with the table behind it, with the with the numbers, is something so simple that you that you yeah that you wonder why we've never done it. Sure. Yeah. So, but overall, that is also some of the question marks that people have on reproducibility. Will people really redo it? You know, uh, and does reproducibility really exist? I think that that is sort of an interesting philosophical <laughs> question that we might uh, that we might get to. Um, Popularity of things like the viewers are, are from the readers or the users yeah. standpoint, but what are publishers doing to, to on the on the author side? Because a lot of the reason that authors don't share the data is they, they don't have time. Yeah. They don't, you know, they're, 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 if the, even if their data, if they're willing to do it, they don't know what to do. They don't have, have time to do it. The format issues. Are any of publishers helping helping the authors? Uh, make it easier to share. Yeah, um, that is a very good question because there is a, a big difference in in different disciplines. And in some disciplines, it has become much more accustomed to do it. You know, in genome research, everybody share. You know, you can't even publish without uh, having put your stuff in GenBank, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In social sciences and humanities, it is very, very difficult. Especially in the social sciences, where people have been gathering their own uh, data via surveys or interviews, then there's a, a lot of reluctance to share that data. 
not just because of privacy aspects, but also uh, sometimes a bit of fear uh, that others might misuse the data or misinterpret the data because the researcher, you know, has it completely in their mind how the data can be used given the way the survey was set up or whatever, and what if others run away with it. There's also some fear of being outscooped, you know, in certain areas in physics, and you often spend several years gathering your data, and then you want to have at least 10 years to make your fame on them before you start sharing them uh, with others. But your question is, of course, what can publishers do there? I think um, they can make it easier for researchers. What also helps is that there's more and more evidence that publications that have research data connected to them get cited a lot more. So that is a direct incentive uh, for the author. And I think that particularly are, are not the mandate type, so that's also why I posted the questionnaire. I'm, I'm more of the incentives, but I think it's also important to have a good infrastructure. If the infrastructure is there and if researchers have good data management plans in which you know they can make use of the data infrastructure and immediately put it there, then also that big hurdle of I finished my project, but now I still have to clean up the data. Uh, and probably that big hurdle also disappears, and it becomes a more automatic element in the whole publication process. Well, I think that's a terrific place to take us into the dryad business meeting. <laughs> so please join me in thanking our three speakers, Tony Brooks and Peter, and we'll hand over to that now.